Okay, this is Dr. Morton. Uh, this is um, DSD for the uh, uh, 7th of October. And uh, if you look, at, let's look at the syllabus real quickly. Uh, let's see, here it is. And I'll shrink me down a little bit. Let's shrink me down and put me over here. All right. So you see, um, if you look at the syllabus, and maybe I'll, maybe I'll move this. I don't know. I'll probably do this. We'll see. See how this works. I know it's going to be a little bit goofed up. Anyway, um, so if we look at the syllabus, what we notice is that on the 7th we have a practicum. So uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I will post on uh, Blackboard a, uh, uh, a Word file that will tell you what to do for the practicum. There's one on there now from uh, 2019. Disregard that one. Uh, but it'll, it'll be, well, it'll be different. Um, and, but won't, and I'll give you a whole week to do it. You just have to turn it in next Wednesday. Um, okay, and then we will have, uh, we will have next week, we will have uh, the test one theory test. But I, I probably will move that to Thursday. So, um, so, and then this Thursday we'll review for it. And I'll tell you what you need to know. Don't, don't panic. It'll be pretty straightforward and easy. Uh, let's see if my hair is all over the place here. Yeah, there we go. Something like that. All right. Okay. Well, anyway. Um, okay. So let's um, let's move along here. So um, so we're gonna uh, the fifth. We were supposed to start unit six, and I'll do that today. Um, so uh, or I'll do yeah, I'll do that today. So that's what we'll cover. All right. Um, okay. I think that's all I need, so I'm going to shrink this out, and I'll shrink me even a little bit more. All right. Okay, and then we'll move this up here. Okay, something like that. Maybe just a little bit more like that. And then we'll move this back. No, we'll move this even more. Okay, something like that. <clears throat> then I'll point it down a little bit. All right, something like that, I think. And maybe we'll, I don't know, maybe, maybe we'll do it here. Yeah, that'll be a little better. Okay, all right, so designing with FPGAs. So um, we're going to talk about how you implement functions with the FPGA. Uh, how we use uh, Shannon's decomposition to make that work, um, okay, and um, and then carry chains, cascade chains, and some uh, and then just some of the how the logic blocks are laid out in commercial FPGAs. Uh, we'll talk about dedicated memory, we'll, distributed memory. We'll talk about dedicated multipliers and some of the cross the cost of programmability. Okay, so. Um, so, uh, so here's, here's basically uh, how an FPGA is set up, okay? So you have, um, you have lookup tables. Now, ours has LUT6s, uh, and you can t hook two of them together to make a, to make a LUT7. Let me just... Okay, so, so we do have LUT6s in ours, and, they, and two can be combined to a LUT7. But this is just a general idea. Roughly, you have a lookup table. And the output of the lookup table can either be directly output or it can be latched. Or both, for that matter. Okay, and usually there's a couple of these per uh, slice. And so we'll talk about that. So if we wanted to use these, so we're going to use, we're going to use this building block and illustrate how we can implement functions. So uh, let's say we want to implement a 4 to 1 mux using this, these building blocks. How do we do that? So here's the expression. Uh, a 4 to 1 MUX has four inputs, I0, I1, I2, and I3, and it has two sense lines, S1 and S0. And so basically, you have S1 prime, S0 prime with I0, S1 prime, S0 with I1, S1, S0 prime with I2, and S1, S0 with I3. I don't know why they didn't do a different color. So anyway, um, so this is how it basically looks. Uh, if we, what, in order to do this four to one mux, we need three two to ones. So, um, 
so we have to generate M1 and M2, and then we can then we can uh, select which one of those with this other two to one mux. All right, so let's look at this. Uh, yeah, so uh, so M1 is going to be S0 uh, S0 prime I0 plus S0 I1. And M2 is going to be S0 prime I2 plus S0 I3. And then M will just be S1 prime M1 plus S1 M2. So that's all there is to it. It's pretty easy. OK. So implementing it with a 4 to 1 using our FPGA. So we let x equal this and y equal that and m equals this. So what we have to do then is we have our first LUT4 takes in I0, I1, and S0. Our second I, uh, LUT4 takes in I2, I3, and S0. And then these two go into X1, X2 in this LUT4. And S1 goes in over here and that generates the output. So it takes one, two, three LUT4s to create this 4 to 1 mux. Obviously, we're wasting some of our capability. So you can see it's kind of expensive to uh, to implement uh, these LUT4s, or these uh, mux, those 4 to 1 muxes using a, uh, using a, It's kind of expensive using a uh, well crud, sorry. So it's kind of expensive using these LUT fours, and a LUT six would kind of be even worse, I think. Although maybe you could do it all in one fell swoop with a LUT six. I have to think about that. Yeah, maybe you could. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could, because you have four inputs plus uh, M one and M two. So you could do you could do the whole thing with one LUT six. Because you have uh, I0, I1, I2, and I3, and M1 and M2, uh, or S1 and S, S1 and S0. So you have six independent variables, and uh, you can generate a single output with those. Yes, that would work fine. Yeah, but you can see a mux is a pretty powerful thing, and that's really that's part of the point of this. It is just to sensitize you to the fact that that muxes are. Uh, are pretty expensive for LUT fours to implement, and it turns out actually that uh, that that's why the Xilinx uh, includes uh, a, a bunch of two to one multiplexers in their slices, so that you do have the ability to uh, uh, it 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 gives you if you have a mixture of lookup tables and multiplexers, it's a pretty powerful uh, combination for implementing pretty much any logic. But if you just have lookup tables, then if you have to implement a multiplexer, it gets kind of expensive. And, and that's kind of the point. All right. Um, so let's see. And so, uh, so you're basically using, uh, if you had an extra LUT3 here, then you could save one of the LUT4s. So that's another way of looking at it. Um, So we just essentially the same thing. Only now we're replacing our we're replacing this lot four with a lot three, and then um, so this is just showing you that if you did have a lot three, uh, you could you could do it. You could do this with a lot three. In fact, you could do it with three lot threes, but you can also do it with one lot six. So that's actually good to keep in mind. Um, when when they uh, when they did these slides, uh, the standard lookup tables in uh, in the vertex uh, chips were were LUT fours. All right. Um, and then if you have a programmable if you have a programmable multiplexer like this. Oh yeah, I see. Yeah, right. You just put S one in here, obviously. Okay, so. 
if you you can implement a four to one mux using the FPGA, but notice expensive to do this. Uh, it takes 48 SRAM cells in the first design, uh, three four input LUTs, 16 SRAMs per lookup table. So that's 48. In the other one, uh, it takes uh, 40, 16, 16 plus eight uh, for the for the LUT three. All right, what about a shift register? What kind of uh, what kind of uh, how difficult is that to implement? Uh, well, so we have, and that, and you know how shift register works. You basically, this will be a shift right. You, you take the, the bits and you move them all to the right, one bit. And here is the, uh, and I'm still having trouble. All right, so so here's our building block again, and so how how is this going to work as far as implementing it? Well, let's let's see. So one of the problems is we only have one flip flop uh, for uh, well two flip flops per slice here, so it's going to take at least two of those in order to uh, sorry. So here we go. All right, so now we have a lot for here, a lot. So we're feeding this through the LUT4. So really, we're not using the lookup tables at all. We're just using our four flip-flops. So it's going to take two full slices here, or four of these basic building blocks. How about a 3 to 8 decoder? So you remember how a 3 to 8 decoder works? So th these th three pins pick one of these lines to be uh, activated. Oh man, where did it go? All right, so uh, so here, this is this is the equivalent to what we have, right? So we have uh, a prime, b prime, c prime turns this one on. A prime b, or sorry, a. Uh, so this is really the bottom one's A, I guess. Well, it's A2. Anyway, so that would be uh, A0, A1 prime, A2 prime, and then A0 prime, A1, A2 prime, and then A1, A0, A1, A2 prime, and then so forth. So we generate the, uh, the, the, the eight different combinations of A, A0, A1, and A2, and we turn on one of these lines. Now, normally there's a chip, chip select, so we can make whatever line we're turning on, uh, we can turn it on and off with the chip select. But all the others will be off. And this is the truth table. So note we just have this DAG and are running down through it, and that's the three to eight decoder. All right, how do we implement this? Well, so, uh, so what do you think? How many programmable logic blocks with four to one LUTs, does, is it going to take? And and top of flip flops. Although we won't need the flip flops for this. How many is it going to take? Well, so what do you think? So so we have to have uh, three different lines. So we have to so we have to we have to. Uh, we have to realize uh, all of these possible functions. So let's see. Yeah, I guess we can look at that. But uh, so may maybe we should just look at that real briefly. Okay, so here's the little drawing. So we have this is our our th three to eight decoder, and here's our logic block. So how many of these is it going to take? Well, it's actually pretty easy to figure this out. First, you have to have eight outputs. So you're going to have to have you're going to have to have times four of these blocks, or you're going to have to have eight LUT fours because you have to have eight eight, eight outputs. That's clear. And uh, once you get that, then it's pretty easy to hook them up. You just put in your three three lines into your into your uh, LUT four. You can double one of the lines in, or you can tie. Or you can tie one of them high, whatever you want to do, and uh, and 
So then if you have four of these, um, then, uh, then, then you just program this one to, uh, to generate an output on, uh, on A0, A1, A2, all prime. And this one you set up for A0, A1, A2. So A0 prime, A1 prime, and A2. And then this, and these, and you just set them up for uh, A0, A1, A2. So it's A0 prime, A1 prime. And then this is going to be A0 prime, A1, A2. And then the next one's going to be A0 and A1 prime, A2 prime. And then A0, uh, A1 prime, A2, and so forth until you finally get down to A0, A1, A2. Like that. So basically, it's going to take four of these are eight LUT fours. Eight LUT fours. Okay, so that makes total sense. All right. Okay, so hence the answer, four. All right, now let's talk about Shannon's decomposition. This is uh, very straightforward. How do you map a six variable function into five variable blocks? Well, you need, you, need, you need at least two five variable blocks and then you need a two to one mux to pick between them. Um, stop, okay, then we go, uh, all right. So um, how do we do this? Well, we just do Shannon's decomposition. So I uh, lost my little facey thing here. All right, so let's say you have an expression, Z of A, B, C, D, E, F. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, and you want to decompose it into two fives. So what you do is you, multi you factor out the A, and you pick, you, you, you basically factor it with uh, two parts, one where A equals zero, and the other where a equals one. So you have a prime times z zero and a times z one. So the z one function is simply uh, is simply the function where uh, uh, where z is zero and the a and the z two function is simply where a uh, the, the z zero is where a is z, a is zero and the z one is where a is one. All right and so th that's going to involve this one's going to involve some A prime terms. This one's going to involve some A terms, assuming there are some. All right, so you put B, C, D, E, F into both of these, and you use a two to one mux driven by A to select whether you do this output or this output. So let's see, uh, I, don't, I can't think if we got a real, yeah. So this just represents the Z1, this just represents the Z0. All right, so here's a real function. Uh, a, B, C, D prime, E, F prime, plus A, B prime, B, A prime, B prime, C prime, D, E, F prime, plus B prime, C, D, E prime, F. How do you decompose this, uh, this six variable expression into two five variable expressions uh, based on A? All right, let's, let's do that. Okay, so here's the expression. Uh, we have three terms. This one, this one, and this one. This is supposed to be an F. I don't know, I wrote another D there at first. Okay, so notice this expression has an A prime. This expression has an A. This doesn't have A. So basically, this is gonna have to show up in both decompositions. So, so we're gonna divide this into a, to a Z0 and a Z1 term. So the Z0 term is just gonna have to have this, A, B, but we're gonna take out the A, and we're left with B, C, D prime, E, F prime. Plus, we have to include this term, B prime, C, D, E prime, F. Because we'll have to have A times this term plus A prime times this term to give us this term. So we'll have to include it in both. And then our Z1 expression, we just take this one, we're gonna drop out the A prime, of course, and we're left with B prime, C prime, D, E, F prime plus this term again, B prime C D E prime F. 
so then when we write it, our original expression uh, z is going to equal a z0 plus a prime z1. And that will, that will give us this original expression. So that's how you do these decompositions. It's very straightforward. Okay. Okay. So, so if we hit this then, uh, here we have, so we can put in uh, B, C, D, E, and F here. And uh, so, well, what we want though, and we want to set it up for, uh, So uh, what if we have uh, a four-variable uh, function generator instead of a four, five-variable function generator? Well, that's simple. Uh, if we have a, a if we have a lot a lot four instead of a lot five, then we're going to have to do another decomposition. We can decompose b out or whatever we want, and then we'll have four of these, and we'll have. Uh, Okay, so if we only have four variable function generators, then we can just recursively apply Shannon's decomposition. And then you wind up with four terms, an A prime B prime term, an A prime B term, an A B prime term, and an A B term. And similarly, if you only had three variable function generators, then, you could, you'd, then you'd have eight of these terms. And you'd have an A prime, B prime, C prime, an A prime, B prime, C, and so forth. So how many four variable function generators are required? Well, we just need, we need four. One to generate Z, zero, zero, one to generate Z, zero, one, one to generate Z, one, zero, and one to generate Z, one, one. All right. So here we have uh, here we have the Shannon decomposition uh, using uh, four variable function generators, and we had to decompose our six variable function twice, once on A and once on B, and that's going to give us this. So z z zero, we have to come up with z zero zero, z zero one, z one zero, and z one one. Or we can call those y0, y1, y2, y3. So we generate y0 here, y1 there, y2 there, y3, and we put in c, d, e, f. And then in this one, we're going to have to select using uh, a and b. And in this one, we're going to have to select using uh, a and b. So, and then finally we have to uh, have a, one more two to one mux here. Yeah, so you do have four functions here. So you can select uh, this one or this one, and this one can select this one or this one. Okay, and then uh, here are our outputs. Uh, so let's see what they would be. So uh, again, we want to decompose this. Maybe I'll let's see. Well, let's let's just yeah. Let me let me see if I can draw. I'll put in my I'll, I'll switch this camera. Maybe I can draw a little bit with this. Okay, so I'm gonna okay and then let's see if we can draw a little bit over here so so here's our so our original expression you see in the green okay so we need to de decompose out the a and the b so the first one's really simple let's take let's take uh, a prime b prime so obviously a prime b prime is going to have to include that that second term and the third term so 
So for a prime, b prime, which is, that's going to be y0, that's, that's going to equal uh, c prime d e f prime plus c d e prime f. Now, uh, now for our a, uh, a prime b term, our y1, uh, so that's y1, then that's going to be, okay, so now we have our a prime b term. So we still have a prime, but we don't need that, that middle term because it's b prime. And we don't need the last term because it's b prime as well. So our so that term's just going to be just going to be just going to be zero. We have nothing there. Doesn't need the first term because that's a, not a prime. All right, and then we have a b prime. That'll be y two. Okay, so that so we now we have to have the first term. Uh, wait a minute. So that's a b. So that's that's they're both one. So that we don't need that one. Uh, but we do need that last b prime term. So that's going to be that's going to be c d e prime f. Okay, and then finally our a b term. That's going to be the first term and only the first term. So that's going to be c d prime e f prime, c d prime e f prime, and that's y three. So you can kind of see how how that how that goes. And that's definitely what we're showing on the slide. Oops, did I leave out? I did a C prime here. Uh, wait, uh, problem. Uh, oh, I think they made a mistake. Y2. A, B prime. Yeah, that's that one. Uh, that that one's uh, C. Yeah, that's C D E prime F. And then the last one, A B, should be C. Yeah, they made a mistake. It, it, it I'm correct. All right. Okay. So. So that is a mistake, and I'm going to fix that. Okay. Okay. So, yes, this is correct. And we still have to have we still have to have this this two to one multiplexer here, or we could I, we could be forced to use a uh, a lot three or a lot four here. So that would be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Or a multiplexer if we have it. So that's quite a few lookup tables. Now, uh, can we do anything to make this simpler? Well, so one of the advantages we can have since since this y1 is a zero, that we can save ourselves this one. Okay. So we get rid of that and we put this line in there. And let's see, and I'll, I'll flip this back over. Okay. And, all right. And I'm going to move this back this way a little bit. Okay, so this is our final solution. And it just worked out that one of our terms, our y1 term, was zero, so we can drop it, and that saves that saves this. Uh, we don't we don't have to. There's no y1 we have to select here. Okay, um, so you can see we can definitely uh, decompose a six-variable function in such a way that we can use LUT fours to uh, to implement it. Now on our FPGA we have LUT sixes. So we don't have a problem. And in fact, we can make a lot seven if we need to. So we're in good shape. All right. So in Shannon's decomposition, you can decompose an n variable function into two n minus one variable functions um, and one two to one mux. 
So uh, if you have a multiplexer, it definitely helps you uh, because otherwise you have to burn another lookup table. So again, just always remember that it's very expensive to implement muxes with lookup tables. Um, and uh, m most of the Xilinx FPGAs provide lookup tables and multiplexers, and that's why, uh, because it's very expensive to implement the multiplexers with lookup tables. That's kind of the main point to get out of this. All right. Um, what about uh, what about a seven variable function generator? How, what does it take to implement that? Well, you can implement it with two sixes and a two to one mux, or four fives and one four to one mux, or four fives and three two to one muxes, or eight fours and one eight to one mux, or eight fours and seven two to one muxes. So uh, remember how just powerful multiplexers are. With, with uh, some nice, generous multiplexers, you can, uh, you can, you can do a lot with, with, four, uh, with LUT 4s. But it's certainly nice to have the LUT 6s that we do on our, on our uh, project. All right, here's, a seven, here's a, how a seven variable function uh, using LUT 4s and MUXs. And these are, these are, uh, yeah, these muxes are all two to ones. Yeah, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right, so the Spartan device provides muxes in addition to lot fours. Our, our Xilinx, uh, our tricks device on our board definitely also provides muxes in addition to LUT fours, or LUT sixes rather. And each this logic unit uh, in in this this is from the Spartan, but this is called a slice. We have the same thing essentially, only it has two LUT sixes uh, and some multiplexers and uh, and some flip flops. So, um, yeah. And uh, our our logic, our slice actually has uh, some carry chain, uh, 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 some some carry chain gate, a uh, carry chain gate as well, and maybe an OR gate, OR chain. All right. So. Um, yeah, we'll squeeze this out. So if you. So here, this seven variable function requires four slices, like that. That's with lot fours. With ours, it just takes one slice because uh, our slice has two lot sixes. So, um, and, yeah, right. So, what? How about if we have to exclusively? Oh, if we do an exclusive OR with A, B, C, D, and E, how many LUT 4s and MUXs? How many slices? Well, that's a good question. So, so it takes two LUT 4s and one 2 to 1 MUX. So how many slices? One slice. Okay. And I'm going to Push this back over here in a minute. All right, well, let me go on. Go on. So carry chains. So um, a lot of times we do implement these carry chains, uh, and we put them in because they they greatly simplify the logic in certain cases. And so if you don't have them, you pay a high price for not having them. So the, your typical full adder has three inputs and two outputs. So with a LUT4, you can have your three inputs, but you don't have your two outputs, so you need two LUT4s to do it. So uh, an N bit adder requires N LUT4s.
one LUT4 can generate the sum and another LUT4 will be required for the carry. So an n-bit adder requires 2 to the n LUT4s. But if you add the carry chain, then you drop it from 2n to n. So if you don't have the carry chain, it, it, it costs you, it doubles the number of LUT4s for the adder. Now, um, here's what the carry chain looks like. So you have your programmable LUT, and then you have this dedicated carry chain. And then this, this, this can be cascaded to the next, uh, to the next, in, to the next programmable look, lookup table, and also to the next dedicated carry chain. So those are very powerful additions. Now remember, uh, uh, partly what we talked about in this, uh, or, or partly why you see this, is. Uh, just the uh, we, we like to add these carry chains because because addition is a huge part of what we do uh, in any uh, logic device so facilitating addition is always a key thing to consider and that's why these carry chains are often included in addition to carry chains we often have cascade chains we can have an and cascade chain and we can have an or cascade chain and here's sort of what it looks like these lookup tables also can have an AND, an AND gate afterwards that takes an input from, from another AND gate, and they can be cascaded like this. And uh, what this then allows you to do is have F1 ANDed with F2 ANDed with FN. Uh, and so as long as you wire them like this, you can AND all the outputs from these lookup tables together, which is super powerful. Or you can leave one out and, and, and have, you know, have a, a different term basically. Or a cascade chain, same thing. You can or a bunch of things together. And if you're doing a uh, POS solution, then this would be very helpful. Or actually vice versa. Uh, SOP over here. Sorry, POS over here, SOP over here. All right, so if you have an R operation of 32 variables needed, how many LUT4s would normally be required? And then how many LUT4s would be required with a cascade chain? So, um, so some uh, of all the cascade chains that are available, the OR cascade chain is most common. Some also provide an AND cascade, cascade chain. Some also uh, provide maybe an XOR cascade chain. All right, so let's think about this. Okay, so let's see if we can solve this. So if if we're gonna have, we wanna cascade 32 together. Okay, so so obviously we're gonna start with one, two, three, um, four, I'm gonna run out of room. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. So that's four, eight, uh, 12, 16, and then I need four more. All right, so that's going to give me that's going to give me the 32 inputs. Now I need to combine all these. Well, so I need another row here, and I can combine four, so I can take one, two. Three, four, and another one down here. One, two, three, four, and then these can be combined with one, two. And that's my output. All right, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. All right, so that's eleven. Okay, so you see, we definitely have. Uh, we definitely have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We can put four into this one, four into that one, and then these can go one and one into this one. So we need eight plus two plus one or eleven if we're gonna do uh, if we're gonna if we don't have the cascade chain. 
So that would be that. But if we do have the cascade chain, then look, we can just daisy chain them together and we only need eight. Okay. Now. Okay. So examples of logic blocks and commercial FPGA. So now we're going to look at some actual examples. So the Xilinx, Spartan, and Vertex, they had, they had LUT4s. So here's a here's a slice in a, in a vertex, and and we do have I do have stuff to look at our our, our tricks. Uh, so here's a lot four, and of course it has sixteen. You 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 have sixteen. Um, you have sixteen bits for f that you get to specify four imp four independent variables, sixteen rows, and sixteen specifications for the outputs. Um, and then you have this carry logic block right here that can go out to the next one, and it's connected to this one as well. You also have another uh, LUT4 down here. And then you have these multiplexers. And you can obviously bring some of these things out and back in. So that's the whole point of these. And you also have inputs coming in from here. And then you have um, two flip-flops and then some control logic here. Okay, then here's here's the Altera solution. You have a LUT4, carry chain, control logic, and a flip-flop, and then some output logic. And you do have this LUT, this LUT uh, chain here, which I think is an, uh, an OR chain. All right, and then here we have uh, the Actel, uh, the versatile, the Fusion versatile, and all these switches are the programmable connections, and they're they're done by Flash by by EEPROM Flash. So your data comes in on three, your clock on two, and then your clear and enable on one, and your clear. Uh, on XC. And you have one, two, three, four uh, multiplexers and a, a, a NOR gate there. So in, your, in our FPGA, sometimes we'll have dedicated memory. Now in the early FPGAs, this was never added. It's become popular primarily because um, primarily because sometimes we need to put in big lookup tables or uh, the other thing that it gets used for extensively now is if we pr program in a soft core and uh, and our soft core um, needs uh, some some place to put the instructions for the program so so we often wind up uh, having that because of the soft core okay this back over. Um, all right, but pretty much all the modern FPGAs include dedicated memory. Uh, Xilinx calls it block RAM, uh, and other manufacturers have other names for it. Okay, and let's see, I'm having trouble getting myself in here. Okay, so yeah, so here's some examples. Um, uh, this is how much. Uh, how much dedicated RAM or block RAM is available and how it's organized. And uh, I don't have the, the, the Artrix not on here. These are older chips. But you see we have, you know, 10 megabytes, 1 to 10 megabytes, 8 to 9, almost 10 megabytes, um, up to 3, and so forth. Now, you also have what's called distributed memory, or memory that's based in the lookup tables that you didn't use for your logic. So if you have unused lookup tables, they can also be used as uh, places for memory. And they call that distributed memory. So a, a LUT4 has 16 bits. How many bits does a LUT6 have? 64 bits. That's correct. All right, so a slice 
in uh, on our chip then has 128 bits of, of distributed memory which is you know it's still not that many bytes what is it uh, eight bytes yeah something like that all right um, And you can see how this can be set up. It can it can have address lines um, and data lines. So uh, the LUT based RAM with a with a LUT four can look like this. Here's your addresses, and then you can have an enable bit for the fourth input, and you can output two bits. All right. Um, now let's see. Yeah. And you can see there's a lot of there are a lot of lookup tables, so there's a fair amount of uh, LUT-based RAM you can have in terms of bits. Um, all right, so we can have uh, here we can here we're going to write and read a memory address. This looks very similar to what we did for our ROM, and we just do this on a clock edge. And so if we're not writing, then we're going to output the data based on the address. We'll also write based on the address. Very similar to how you did your, your ROM. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, this, I think one time I, I put this quiz in. I'm not going to, yeah. We won't, well, you can, you, can, you can think your way through this one. So, so uh, yeah. Okay, so uh, that basically completes uh, part A of uh, of our uh, of unit six. Oops, didn't make that work. There we go. Okay, so. Uh, so, like I said, I will uh, I will uh, have out on Blackboard the uh, the practicum, and you'll have till next week on Wednesday at midnight to uh, submit a uh, to uh, submit your solution. I, I'm I'll, I'll make it clear on the sheet uh, how I want that submitted, um, and I'll, I I still have to put that together. I'm sort of I have several ideas, but I haven't. Uh, Put it to paper yet but i will and i'll post it by uh it'll be available by 8 a.m uh wednesday morning uh but i don't think i'll do i, I may skip the quiz with this lecture uh, i may just let the uh let the the practicum uh, take the place of that quiz uh, not to worry too much about the practicum but i mostly just want to keep you working in very log so that you uh that so that you're uh familiarity with it uh, increases and I'll and I'm probably going to have this quiz unlike the one done in 19 where you could do it with a couple of other people I think I'll have you do this one by yourself but it I think it'll be it'll be fairly straightforward all right so that pretty much does it uh, we will um, I will talk to you all uh, uh, again on Friday and I might even have a little uh, uh, I may do a little help session on Friday. For sure I will on Monday. Well, I'll do it on Monday. So if you need help with your practicum, uh, come, to the, uh, come to the office time on Monday at 12. All right. With that, uh, we will um, uh, terminate the recording, and we'll, we'll see you on Friday.